We are really blessed to be here with you. Uh, that God has allowed us to come here and celebrate our citizenship in the kingdom. Uh, as ambassadors, we represent God with love and with gentleness and with respect. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father, we love you and we're grateful that you allow us to represent you. We know that it's an awesome responsibility and we just pray that you will help us to support one another and provoke one another into love and good deeds to go out and to let the world see how wonderful it is to be a member of the family of God, to be in the kingdom of God. And we just pray, Father, that as we go through this uh, class this morning, that you will enrich us, that you will encourage us, that we will uh, encourage one another, and that we will be refreshed to, to go out and to be ambassadors in the world as well as here in the family. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we are ambassadors for Christ, and we are reconciled. As ambassadors, we are constantly developing our skills. We are constantly being reconciled and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not like we showed up instantly worthy of being able to represent God. Uh, God has been so gracious to us that he has allowed us to be the ones to represent him. And certainly, whatever we do, whether in word or deed, everything that we do, we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we know that God has blessed each and every one of us with some skills. He's blessed all of us with some abilities and talents that we cannot afford to put in the ground. Now, a lot of us think, well, you know, a lot of the things that ambassadors do for Christ is a responsibility of certain people that carry official titles. All of us carry a title, amen? We are Christians. We are ambassadors. We are a children of God. And it's an awesome privilege, opportunity, and responsibility if we don't do something with what God has given us. And you might say to yourself, well, I don't have any skills. I don't have any abilities. I don't have any talents. Every one of us in here does. If you're a parent, you have some skills. If you're not a parent, you have some skills. If you're breathing, God has given you ability to be able to uh, evangelize. And so we know that we're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this is what, what it looks like. Uh, meet our new brother, uh, Richard. He's been here many times. And while he's sat here in the auditorium, uh, he's, I think he's in the class upstairs right now. Uh, but he's interacted with a lot of people here. And if you've interacted with him, those are duties that you have as an ambassador. If you've spoken to Richard before he went into the watery grave of baptism, you have carried out some of your ambassadorial duties. Now, uh, I, I, was, I mentioned on, on one Sunday morning that we had somebody here who wanted to have a Bible study, and three people immediately jumped up. Now, all of them were sisters. Oh, okay. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. If we didn't have sisters in the body of Christ, we'd be in bad shape, amen? These sisters, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about that. But uh, he's, a, he's a, a, a new brother in Christ, and it's important for us to realize, you know, a lot of times people think, you get them to the water and that's it. This is just where it starts. We have to continue to show him, as a new ambassador in Christ, uh, what it's like to be a member of the family of God and the people that he interacts with, his family, his loved ones, his workers, and all those kinds of people. So uh, please uh, take the time to, if you haven't already spoken to uh, Brother Richard Coombe, uh, I think he'll probably come down after the, the class turns out upstairs. Uh, and so uh, uh, I have to remind you about this big event that's coming up next month. It'll be here before you know it. It's a little bit more than a month away. But there's a lot of planning, a lot of coordination that's going on. The uh, online life group is doing a lot of it, uh, a lot of the planning and coordination. But 
as we have said, we want each and every one of you to invite somebody. And if you're going to invite somebody, it's important for us to have a, uh, a good, accurate determination of who's going to actually be there. You ever go to McDonald's to get a, I, I love ice cream. And I go to McDonald's to get an ice cream cone. I, I, I want to go through the drive through I know a lot of y'all don't go to Mickey D's, and that's OK. I get it. I don't go there a lot of times either. Remember a study we had some time ago about the 10-year-old Big Mac? Y'all don't remember that, but anyway. Uh, my point is, is that when you go through uh, Mickey D's just to get an ice cream cone, and you pull up there and they say, the ice machine's broke. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's, that's messed up, you know? It should not be. <laughs> you should not be able to go to a place that makes milkshakes and ice cream cone, and they say the ice cream cone machine is broke, or the milkshake machine is broke. We don't want somebody to show up at the Lord's house. This is God's house, right? Everything we have belongs to God. Uh, and this is, we're here uh, in this place for the convenience of being able to not, you know, get rained on or, you know, that kind of stuff. So when folks show up, we want to make sure that when we provide them with physical sustenance after they come here and gotten soul food and fellowship and just, we're just going to love them to pieces when they get here. Uh, we want to make sure that if they are going to come, that we provide some vittles downstairs and we're going to be such gracious hosts. Well, it, it, and this is for everybody. Somebody told me to make sure that I point that out. This is for all of the members and your guests. So that's why it's important for us to know who's coming, because we might have to put tables outside and, you know, in the classrooms and all kind of stuff. It's going to be overflowing, okay? And we're going to be on our best behavior, right? You know how when folks show up to your house and you tell the kids, you better behave. Well, this is our house. And folks are going to show up. And, and we just need to just be ourselves and show how we love each other and, and do uh, all the right things. Amen? Okay, last week uh, we talked about the lost sheep. And one of the exercises that, uh, that you had an opportunity to participate in, and thank you for those of you who actually participate, we talked about lost sheep and what are some of the things that we can do to bring them back. This was that, that gold, gold sheet that I passed out. <laughs> and, and I asked you to go from 10 to to, to, to one. So 10 was your, you know, one that you felt like, yeah, we can do this. This is really easy. This is low hanging fruit. We're going to jump all over this. And there were like, I think there was something like, it was two pages. So I think it's like 60 to 80 different bullets on there. Some of them were similar, but the word that rang out the most was what? Encouragement. Encouragement. That's something all of us can do. If you just smile at somebody, just say something nice, that's encouraging to people. So we can all do that. So let's look at some of these encouragement cards. We can pray for folks, uh, call them or text them. Uh, sometimes we have to show love and patience and mercy, uh, offer help in any kind of way. Maybe somebody needs uh, you to babysit or to pick them up, drop them off, or, or you know, do something like that. They're just, and, 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 and to a great extent, these are people that, you know, are already members of the body of Christ that we want to say, hey, look, you're missing out on some family stuff. Come on back and, and enjoy this. Uh, one of the things that, one of the longer bullets that we had was be true friends as Jesus Christ was and not be judgmental. No matter what, it's not about you. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are representing Christ. And so uh, you know that when we did the training before and we talked a lot about Brother Whitaker talked a lot about bringing people over for an organoleptic experience. Organoleptic experience. Sitting down and having food. <laughs> because when you eat, you know, just there was a reason why they, that, that meeting that Jesus had with his disciples was over a meal. There's something unique that happens over a meal. You're, you're physiologically satisfying some very necessary things within your body, and your brain says, this is a satisfaction. This is a good thing. I feel good about this. And when you have a, an interaction with somebody, that kind of 
pulls it all together as well. The brain is very complex. But when you sit down and have a good meal, and you have a good conversation, and you make a connection with somebody, that's a good thing. So uh, we really encourage you uh, to, when you have an, a guest that's going to come here on Sunday or any time, to you know, have a cup of coffee, because that's a granuloptic experience, coupled with you sitting there and being an ambassador for Christ, and they're going to just see you radiating with, with, with your spiritual you know, crown. You know, you're just gonna it, you're just gonna be a child of God in such a way that they're gonna know uh, that this is the way that they want to be. Now, here's here's something that's very interesting. We talked about uh, going out to those who are already members of the body of Christ, and not too long ago, I mean, a couple, maybe last week, we talked about why they left, and we talked about Flavel Yakely, and he gave a whole lot of reasons why people left. And we read this scripture, and the, the word that p- jumps out at that is. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened, folks who came and were part of the body of Christ, and that they left. And, 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 I, and I kept on resounding on that word impossible. And I thought, now, come on, God, with God, nothing is impossible. All things are possible. I came face to face with this situation last week, a sister in Christ who has left the body of Christ. And she has a lot of bitterness in her heart. And I, I, I wasn't prepared for it. You know, I, I know how I feel being a member of the Church of Christ. I mean, some of you have probably had some disappointments in the body of Christ, right? You probably had somebody that, you know, let you down or didn't, you know, necessarily do things the way that you would like for them to do. But we cannot allow a person to cause us to lose our relationship with God. It's just not worth it. I mean, you know, that, that's, I've had my heart broken a bunch of times. But, you know, somehow, if you stay true to God, he has the answer to it all. And, and he can, you know, make it all work for you. Uh, and so I, I ask, encourage us to not be discouraged when we reach out to those people who have, for whatever reason, left the body of Christ. Be persistent. Be loving, be kind. Remember what it was, what was like for the prodigal son when he went out there. And he, he had to get to the lowest point, was, was, was in the slop you know, with the pigs. Uh, you might find somebody out there like that. And, and, and I'll tell you this. When you reach out to somebody, you know, whether they're in the, in the slop with the pigs or not, I mean, if they stepped away from the family of God, That's a dangerous place to be. Uh, The Bible tells us to take heed lest you fall. And we who are spiritual must restore that person to a a right way with the family of God and a a right spiritual mind with God. So the word of God tells us in Matthew uh, 10, 16, that we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. What? What does that mean? A serpent is very cunning, very clever, very, uh, you know, able to uh, influence, as we know from, from Eve in the garden, you know, let alone the fact that, what is she doing talking to a snake? <laughs> but anyway, but harmless as doves. We talked about, uh, I think we looked at this passage last week, and, and, and one of the slides further down the line talks a little bit about being gentle. Uh, it says, uh, it talks about uh, meekness and fear. And then another translation talks about gentleness and love. So as we go to restore these people, or go to re- remind these people of the importance of being faithful in the body of Christ, as we step out there as ambassadors, it's important for us to to be gentle, to take our time, and to be patient, like uh, one of the, the comments that came back. By the way, that, that, uh, that top 10 that I put up there, ways in which we can seek, uh, restore, or go out for the lost sheep, I intended to have that printed out, but I just kind of got busy doing some other stuff. Uh, I've been also promising uh, Chris that I was going to 
give those to him so that he could post them online so that you could look at those. Because, like I said, there's over 60 things on there. You might not want to do the top 10, but I think those top 10 are something that all of us can do. All of us can, you know, text somebody or call somebody or just encourage somebody or smile at somebody or do some, some of those kind of things that might help people come back. I want to look at a story today about somebody that we're very familiar with in uh, uh, 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter. Uh, Abigail. Remember Abigail? We have some Abigails in this congregation, amen? Now, you might not know who they are. You might not see them because they are kind of behind the scenes. If you go downstairs, you'll see some of our Abigails down there that we entrust our children with. Some of the Abigails, uh, when, when you're sitting down there eating and stuff, you might not see them because they're in the kitchen. They're uh, making sure that things get done. Uh, some of our Abigails that you might not see because, you know, but you see their handiwork. You saw the flyer that came out this morning. It was done by one of our Abigails. They kind of diligently worked behind the scenes, didn't want a whole lot of, you know, fanfare, and, and this is what I've done and all that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, it's all about, it. it's like the bullet up there that said, it's not about you. Uh, it's about God. It's about us being ambassadors for Christ. Now, this, this lesson, this, uh, this story about Abigail, uh, is it, a fascinating story. And it's a perfect example, in my mind, of what an ambassador would do. Uh, here is Abigail. Well, first of all, you remember David. And it says, while David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was sharing a sheep. Nabal was this guy, he was really, really wealthy. He had, I don't know, a thousand sheep, uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of herds and, and all that kind of stuff. He was very wealthy. And David and his uh, men, his army, were always, they were out there in the, in the wilderness protecting this, this Nabal's, you know, uh, empire. And so when it came time for David, as he was running from Solomon, you know, he, he said, look, we need some, we need some provisions. So go to this guy, Nabal, and, uh, and tell him that we need some help. Say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to yours. Uh, now, he knew that he was shearing sheep, so that means they, you know, they had the resources there. And when the shepherds were with us, he says, when your shepherds were with us out there in the field and my army was out there protecting you and so forth, we didn't steal from them, everybody was safe, you know, we some soldiers, so we could jack them up if we wanted to, but we were really nice to them. And so, you know, when we need you to do something for us, please kind of, you know, be kind to us. But when they went, and so he sent his, his, his servants down there. David sent 10 of his men down there and said, hey, could you help out uh, David? He needs some sustenance and so forth. And what did Nabal say? He said, who is this David? And who is this son of Jesse? Uh, many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and my water and my meat and, and, and go out and slaughter uh, food and and give this to this men. Who knows who they are? And so David's men said, oh, okay. Let's go back and tell David. How do you think David reacted? He wasn't happy. <laughs> David was not happy. And so here's where the ambassadorship comes in. Here's where Abigail comes in. The Bible says, I mean, at least theologians say she was very beautiful. But she was also very kind. She was also very wise. And she had some real ambassadorial skills. Okay, so when David's men went back and said, hey, we went down there to talk to Nabal, and he said, get out of here. We ain't got time for you. And so David was furious. And David was like, okay, we're we going to show him something. He got 400 of his men, and they were going to go down there and really mess him up. He said, Read different translations say it different ways, but it's like there's not going to be a single male standing after I get through going in there and tearing everybody apart. David was not a happy camper, okay? So he was getting ready to go down there and mess things up. So along comes Abigail. Oh, first of all, one of Abigail's servants heard that, that 
David sent his people down there, and Nabal was just mean. He was just nasty. He just didn't act right. We would never be that way in the body of Christ, would we? Okay. <laughs> We're going to be nice and kind and loving and gentle and Christ-like in every way. When people come in here, no matter which one of us they come up against, they're going to walk away with a good feeling about having interacted with the people of God because that's just who we are. Anyway, Abigail, uh, here's what happened. with uh, uh, First of all, verse, uh, verse 18. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five shares of roasted grain, and hundreds of cakes and raisins and 200 cakes and pressed figs and, and loaded them on the donkeys. And then she told her servants, go ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband. Why? Because he was an idiot. I mean, his name means fool. Okay? So she exercised some ambassadorial skills. The Bible says that she came out on her donkey into a mountain ravine, and there were David and his men descending towards her, and she met them. David had just said, it's been useless, all my watching over your fellow's property and in the wilderness so that nothing was missing, and he has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be ever so severely if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. He was going to go kill everybody. Everybody. Maybe he'll let the women and children be okay. He was going to kill all the men, right? And Abigail got there and said, um, wait a minute. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to the wicked man Nabal. He is like his name. His name means fool and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see, this, uh, see the men my Lord sent. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. So she's saying, anybody that's your enemy, I hope he's like this dude, because we know bad things are coming for him. And as it turns out, I think he had a heart attack. Well. At any rate, he died 10 days later, <laughs> okay? Uh, so she said, please forgive my servant's presumptions. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight for the Lord's battles. So we see that Abigail came to, uh, to the rescue, and this is what happened when... Uh, when Nabal's young men informed Abigail, and she came to the rescue and did these things and, 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 and saved the day. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent, these, which sent thee this day to meet me, and blessed be the advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood. That's that's perfect example of ambassadorialship. She intervened. She knew what was the right thing to do, and she knew that she was uh, could 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 quell the situation by going and doing the right thing. Now we are very blessed that we never have to go and intervene for somebody in the family of God for doing something crazy like that. Amen. But the point is, the point I want to make here is, is that. People like Abigail have done things that 
have really made a difference in terms of the way things go in the family of God. Since we all are representing God. One of the things that was said last week as we were going through some of the 10 characteristics of an ambassador, somebody said that we should be like Jesus. And that's the whole point. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We are to be direct representatives of our Father, and we are to, to think like him, we're to act like him, and we're to be like him. To the extent that if anybody even thinks about saying anything rude or obnoxious or offensive about us, they'll be ashamed. People will say, still Bill? Oh, psh, he's a Christian. He goes over there to the Church of Christ. He's one of those good people. You can't talk bad about him. And all of us should have that reputation. We should not have the reputation of somebody that gets into scraps with people or gets into fights with people or is argumentative with people or that's just mean and rude. We should have the kind of ambassadorial reputation that when people see us, they have a good impression of who we are and they know that we are ambassadors for Christ. How many of you remember this guy? Say amen. amen. Wonderful brother in Christ. Brother Lawrence Wells. That's Brother Lawrence. Yeah, it was it, summertime. He's wearing a, a cap. <laughs> so he's from the islands, okay? So, you know, it was breezy out there that day, so he had a cap on. This brother has 300 students in the World English Institute. He has 300 students. I think he said he's 88 years old. And he's working for the kingdom. He's an ambassador. He's out there teaching people conversational English. Uh, now, it's a whole different program than one that I'm going to mention in a few minutes uh, that we do here at World Bible School. But I, I, I just think it's important that, you know, if when we say, you know, I don't have time or, I, you know, I'm, this man is 80-some years old, and he works with about 20 students every day. So to me, that's an inspiration. Uh, that makes me think, you know, when I say I don't really have time, uh, then uh, I think about Brother Wells. 300 students, at least 20 a day. When we were sitting there talking to him, he, he had students that were on his computer that he was interacting with. So I'm just saying that. When we talk about time that we have, if we could take out an hour in a day, we can get it done. Brother Crazy is going to say a few words about uh, World Bible School, which is what we actually have here. Uh, and then after that, my, I want to ask my son to say something about uh, the missionary trip that he has, has just come back from or just went, came back from recently. Uh, he's not going to be able to go into detail in just a few minutes, but I think it's important for us to realize that there are people out there doing things for the cause of Christ. They're an inspiration to us. And, uh, Brother Crazy can tell you a little bit about the helpers that are needed. Uh, in the World Bible School. I think we have here, and the beauty of this is that the students that he has are local students. These are students that are like in Baltimore, Laurel, or whatever. Go ahead, brother. Uh, currently, we have, we have the nursing home. We have the World Bible School. We have um, other programs that are running, as uh, our brother has listed them. But we really need helpers for the World Bible School. Amen. Currently, we have about 35 students. And um, those students are shared between myself, Brother Carl, and Sister Naomi. Averagely, every day, we have about two students coming in from the Baltimore, Laurel, uh, local areas and so if we have even about 10 helpers that will help us to be able to evangelize mm -hmm. in this process you have just a home and grading students you don't have to think about the answers all the answers are already there you just have to look at it and compare it with um, whatever the students have stated as the answer and see if it's correct. If it is not correct, you copy and paste it in the student's uh, text box, and that is it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, currently, Sister Naomi has about, uh, this morning I counted it, and he has about 20 students. Mm. And I have about six. And Brother Carr has the rest. <laughs> we are getting overwhelmed. A lot of students are coming in, and they are very much interested in learning about the Lord Jesus the Christ. This is the time that all of us must come together. If we cannot, like, we cannot go outside and uh, the homes to go and preach, this is a way to preach the word of God within the comfort of your own home. Mm -hmm. There are no threats, there are no risks, nothing. The only thing is to log in as a helper and greet the students. That's it. It's very easy. You don't have to think about anything other than to copy paste, and that is it. It's complete. Mm. So if you are interested, please, we have the opportunity. Please let us all come together to evangelize Laurel, Baltimore, College Park, all these areas. It's just this area that we are evangelizing, and we know that in the long run, all of them are going to come to church. They are coming to church. Because the moment they understand the scriptures, they will come and worship with us. That is our long-term goal. Thank you so much. So you see how, how uh, it's really amazing how advanced uh, the uh, World Bible School has become over the years. I'm sorry. Um, if you come up, Chris, uh, see a few words. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. He's, uh, Bob's got it. Uh, I was privileged to talk to uh, one of the people that, um, uh, that Christopher talked, that worked with over there in India. I won't get into too much about what he has talked about, but these are just uh, some of the slides that kind of depict some of the things that are going on. Go ahead, Chris. Morning, church. Um, so, yes, um, the minister who leads the uh, ministry there. There are actually three generations Church of Christ evangelists. So they were introduced to the gospel by a Canadian um, minister by the name of J.C. Bailey. Uh, so his, uh, is this being recorded? Yes. Okay, all right, so I'll make sure not to leave names. Uh, if you don't know, uh, in India, in terms of religion, about 80, over 80% 80 is Hindu, 15% is Muslim, and then 5% is others, with Christianity about 2.3%. Uh, currently, India is going through a process of um, becoming recognized on the geopolitical stage, a potential superpower. Uh, so there are political groups that are using Christianity as a enemy and scapegoat to unify the Indian people behind Hinduism, and so Christianity has been in India for hundreds of years, but it's not until the past 10 or, or maybe 15 years that it's been facing more than usual persecution. So, for example, um, even me as a Westerner coming over, they're already suspicious I might be there for missionary work. So I had to be prepped to say the right things at immigration so as not to trigger them to follow me or follow my contact in India, that I might be there for charity missionary work. So I went there for a vacation, had a great time. Uh, the contact I know there, I've known him for 20 years. So he knew me when I had hair and when I was slimmer. Um, so we have a good long history together. During those 20 years, I have helped out little by little financially with some of the, the um, uh, ministry that they do. So let me explain more about that. If you're familiar with India, they have what's called a caste system. It's part of their culture. It has been for thousands of years. Caste system, essentially, in summary, is the top caste is the priestly, priestly um, caste, and then followed by that is the ruling class, then the warrior class, then I believe it's either the merchant or farmer class, then the peasants and the artists, and at the very, very, very bottom is what's known as the untouchables. As the name implies, these are people that they don't even talk to, don't touch. They do all the really dirty work. They are not at all really taken care of, at, so they don't have access to health care. Uh, they sometimes don't even have access to food. So they're really just untouchable, as the name goes. 
So they actually minister to those people. So even Christians or, or, or preachers who are non-denominationals don't even administer to these people because they can't contribute any money to the ministry. So my contact for their, when they evangelize, um, they're evangelizing to those people, uh, the people that are neglected by society. And India is actually a much more complicated the, the caste system is more complicated. I just mentioned five or six levels. There's actually hundreds, hundreds of levels of caste based upon your family name. When you're born into it, you can't get out of it. You're stuck there. So what you see behind me um, is they have, they minister to 15 tribal congregations. And this is in the southeastern region of India, known as the Andhra Pradesh. Uh, so that's, that's me with the colorful shirt on. Uh, <laughs> So uh, imagine when you go camping and you have really no access to anything but the nature and the land. That's their life from the time they're born to the time they die. That's, that's how they live. That, that rickshaw tent you see behind them is their home. So imagine your home, brick and mortar and all that nice stuff. That's their home. And they're, they're not depressed about it. That's just the life that they know and grew up with, and they're happy if they even have that. But that's what they have to, to live with. It's like going to a refugee camp. But this is everyday life for them. So the way that they make their living, um, I mean, these are families, families with children and everything like that. Uh, the way they make their living is they pick up recyclables to be able to collect enough money for the day to eat. Um, they're also living in the wilderness, so they're subject to poisonous snakes, tigers, you know, anything out there in the wilderness they have to deal with as well. Um, so the ministry work that they do, in the bottom right, you'll see that there's a bore well. There's a well there for water, because otherwise they have to walk miles and miles for water. So um, part of what they do, um, my contact has relationships with members of the church in the U.S., Whenever they're able to contribute, they try to put that money towards either food across their 15 tribal congregations. Um, there's also a leprosy colony. So we've heard of leprosy in the Bible, and we think that that doesn't exist anymore. It does. And there is people with leprosy even in, in India. Um, so they try to help with providing them food and medication. Uh, they also run a, a preacher school. Um, because they have about 15 preachers full-time, um, and they try to meet together to train them and to teach them gospel, and they also minister to these congregations. Uh, there's a few congregations that are in the far wilderness. We're talking like Jungle Book. If you ever watched the movie Jungle Book, and you saw like, oh, there's a village at the end. Those are those people. They live way out there in the wilderness, and they try to, they try to share the gospel with them as well. Mm -hmm. They also have a ministry for teaching widows. So, again, these are people who don't have access to health care. So it's not uncommon for there to be widows because the men just die because of lack of health care. So uh, they have a ministry where they try to teach the women to be seamstresses so that they can provide for themselves and for their children. Some of these ministries, they've had to discontinue because of a lack of resources. So um, when I was there, um, I felt compelled that I want to go there every year to help out. So um, I've gathered the, an understanding of what they need in terms of continuing these ministries, what ministries they would like to either start, as well as which regions of the country they would like to be able to expand the gospel. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions or would like to discuss more, you can talk with me or my father. Um, but anyway, thank you. Thanks, son. Uh, what really grabbed me when I was talking to the missionary that he, he uh, works with, is working with for 20 years. Uh, when he, we did a, uh, he got on a Zoom call with us and we were just talking about some of these things and he went into a, a whole lot more detail and some of the things that happen there that are part of the missionary process, we can't talk about right now uh, because we're, we're live out on YouTube and we have to be very careful about some of the things that could happen to the other people that are still there in India that could impact upon them because of us discussing some of the political ramifications of the things that happened there. But what grabbed me is, you know, I've, I've baptized people in this baptistry back here. <laughs> 
And we always complain about the water not being warm enough, okay? Look at that picture down in the far left-hand corner. Uh, that's, that's where people get baptized. And if they have to go out in the wilderness and uh, uh, baptize somebody, uh, it makes you realize how, how very blessed we are. We're very blessed to be here in this opportunity to be able to do World Bible School, spend an hour or two every day to just you know, help bring somebody to Christ, uh, to uh, use the uh, Back to the Bible, which we uh, have promoted, and we're going to look at some more before we get done with this, this quarter and looking at some of the, the things that we're doing as ambassadors for Christ. And uh, it's just a real blessing for us to do that. But if you want to talk to Christopher, uh, he's going to be here uh, until, you know, some of this week. Uh, if you're interested in getting some more of the details, he also has a very detailed PowerPoint presentation that at some point, hopefully we can share with the congregation in a closed circuit so that we can really uh, share with you some of the details about some of the amazing work that they're doing there with this, this three-generation family of people who have been trying to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ over there. But the thing is, is that we need to consider one another to provoke unto love and good deeds. And we want to encourage each other. And one of the things as we wrap up this morning that we talked about last week is some of those essential qualities of being a Christian. And, and as an ambassador, who we represent and some of the things that we do. Some of the essential qualities, and these are the 10 that I w went through, but I didn't get through all of them. So I want to try to race through and maybe perhaps get through as many as we can before the 10, 15 moment comes around. But we know that we need to be ready. Uh, be ready always to give an answer to everyone, the reason for the hope that is in you. And again, we talked about meekness and fear, but also with gentleness and respect. It's important for us to, to have a good feel for it. If somebody comes up to you and says, why are you a Christian? At the very least, we should be able to say, this is why. Uh, and uh, the exercise that you got two or three weeks ago that was to, to tell your story. We're going to do that, and we're going to, uh, at some point before this quarter's up, we're going to break up into groups, and you're going to get a chance to do your elevator speech. Everybody know what an elevator speech is? Sort of, kind of? Yeah. Okay. You're going to just, one of, we'll pair up, and one person will be the non-Christian, and you'll be the Christian, and they'll say, how come you're a Christian? What's up with this Christian thing? And you can tell them why you're a Christian and how you became a Christian. Tell them your backstory. That's a really very powerful tool that we need to have in our kit bag as Christians. If you can't do anything else, I mean, Paul, Saul of Tarsus told his story several times. And we're reading about it thousands of years later. But we also need to be patient. Sometimes we study with people and we want them to just obey the, the gospel right away, but it doesn't always happen that way. But be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And... Uh, and we know that the, the Christians in the first century, they counted it a, 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 a privilege to suffer in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, we probably don't have to suffer. We probably don't have, you know, people might make fun of us. I mean, I've been made fun of for being a Christian. But the fact that we do the baptism thing and all that kind of stuff, people think that's kind of weird. Uh, and then we show up every Sunday, every Sunday, and Wednesday too? <laughs> You know, I, I had this book on, on successful business uh, practices, and they say, go to church at least twice a month. Twice a month. We know that as, 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 as Christians that we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves, but that we should try to be here as often as we can. Um, we uh, also talked about the whole armor. We need to go out and be prepared uh, to face the world because actually, uh, we know that we're going out as, as sheep among wolves. And we need to, to really have a lot of tools in our kit bag. We need to be fully armored with, with righteousness and truth and, and peace and all those kinds of things that the whole armor of God gives us as we go out and face the world. We also need to be clear. We need to be clear. And so how do we be, uh, learn how to be clear? We have to study we have to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to be fair. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come uh, to repentance. Uh, it's important for us to, to be patient uh, because God is patient with us. We need to be honest. 
uh, providing an honest things, uh, not only in the Lord, but in the sight of everybody that we come in touch with, and to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. We sing the song, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And finally, we need to be attractive. People need to be attracted to us because, you remember David? I mean, not David, uh, Joseph. The Bible tells us all the stuff he did, just, it, was just, it just went well. It just went good. People ought to want to be around us because we're ambassadors for Christ. And we represent that which is good. And we you know, do the right thing. They know they can trust us. They know we're going to be honest. They know that we are, are children of the Most High God. So we need to be attracted to people. And finally, we need to be dependent. Dependent on who and dependent on what? We need to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. There's going to be stuff we don't understand. God's going to send po folks to us, and we're just not going to, how did this person come into my life? And they might be an irritation to us, but we need to trust God as ambassadors. God is in control of our lives, amen? And we need to be trusting and, and what he's going to uh, lead us to. And finally, I told you we're going to be telling our stories because everyone has a story. <laughs> and so uh, be prepared to, uh, each Sunday when we show up, that might be one of the exercises that, that we're going to be uh, doing uh, as we come and, and share that. And, 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 and in the meantime, let's encourage one another. And again, as we build up for, for friends and family, uh, the 19th, Mother's Day is a cutoff list. We need to know by Mother's Day how many uh, guests you're going to bring so we can know what we need to do, how we need to set up the tables and the food and all that sort of thing. And we need to kind of prepare ourselves and put on our best ambassadorial uh, persona and be prepared to receive people that are going to come in here that will soon, hopefully, one day be our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, God, for your many blessings. Thank you for this privilege to be ambassadors. There are some aspects of it, Father, that seem kind of scary at times. And we've been made aware of this morning that uh, living in America, we have a lot of privileges and a lot of conveniences and a lot of uh, opportunities that, uh, that we have an opportunity to take advantage of. And we just pray that you will bless us and strengthen us and encourage us and be with us in everything that we do. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, this is Ricky Cook, one of the ministers here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to watch our video broadcast. We'd also like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. We have worship services at 8 a.m. and another at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. We also have a worship service in Spanish at 1 p.m. Sunday afternoons. Bible class is on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have Bible class in both English and Spanish. Please know that you're always welcome here. We look forward to seeing you.